This is a funny question that somebody asked Jesus in Matthew chapter 18. It says this, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked. Now before I read this question, think about that song we just sang. A million angels fall, echoing, holy is the Lord. And this is the question the disciples ask. Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? <laughs> ah, Jesus, he called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, quote, truly, I tell you, unless you change yep, and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. Lord, we ask that you would be honored and glorified by the worship that we have been participating in, and we ask that by the power of Jesus in us, by the movement of you, God the Holy Spirit, in this place, let the worship continue through the proclamation of your truth. We submit ourselves to who you are, and we just want more of you today. Bend us, transform us. We love you. Amen. You may be seated. We are continuing in our Us series. This is number three of four. And as normal for this, series. We're going to be bouncing all over everywhere. Does any, is anybody bothered by where I'm standing? Anybody's personality that just can't quite handle me being not in the middle? <laughs> Sorry. You're going to remember this sermon, I'll tell you that. I'm going to say some things today that I think, I'm, I'm going to make a bold statement. I believe that God wants to use what's going to happen out of these notes here and if, if you can hear it, tomorrow's going to be a different day for you. But I'm going to open and close with the same statement. Don't make a big decision today. Make one single strong one. Don't make a big decision today. We, we have, our, our lives are largely dictated by priorities. And I've come across some, some funny, well, not that funny, they're painful, little things that, I don't know if you've ever seen this little uh, thing that you can go through where on one side of the page you write down your priorities in life in order, and then on the other side of the page you write down what you spend the most amount of time on in order, and then you compare them, and you ask yourself Why? If that's so important to me, why am I spending so much time on number eight? Oh, man, that's a sucker punch in the belly. It doesn't feel good. I once heard uh, some advice from Warren Buffett. Might be the only time you hear me quote Warren Buffett. I'm not even going to quote him. I'm just going to refer to it. I think it's good advice. He said, take your top 25 goals in life and write them down. Now, from those top 25, circle five that are most important. And once you circle five, consider the other 20 enemies of the five. Mm, that's all right, isn't it? That's how you become a billionaire. No, there's probably more to it than that. <laughs> I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians. I'm in chapter 10. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If an unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered as a sacrifice, then do not eat it. 
for both for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. I'm referring to the other person's conscience, not yours. For why is my freedom being judged by another's conscience? If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced for because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everyone in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. So you could, by this, you could also call this sermon, it's, the title of the sermon is Margin. Huh, get it? I'm in the margin. The whole band there. In the margin. But you could also call it Living in the Greater Good. Or you could call it Majoring on the Majors. Have you ever heard that phrase? Sometimes we get frustrated and we realize that one of the reasons we're frustrated with what's happening is because we're majoring on the minors. So you could call this sermon majoring on the majors. I'm going to give you three steps. If you have any inkling, any inkling that maybe there could be an adjustment to your priorities, I'm going to give you three clear steps of what to do about it. Step number one, discover priorities. I'm going to tell you right now what all three of them are. Discover priorities, improve priorities, live priorities. That's all three of them. Discover your priorities, improve your priorities, and live your priorities. Number one, discover them. We live in an your truth culture now, don't we? A, a phrase that we're hearing more and more and more and more to people, young people especially, are being encouraged to discover your truth. A subjective truth that Apparently, any one of us can make up what our truth is for the world. Verse 24 is at complete odds with this. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. That is not the truth that anyone is discovering when they discover your truth. No one discovers that. Genesis 3, the fall of mankind, has been repackaged a million times, over and over and over. It's all about pride. The whole your truth freedom concept is built on ego and pride. But we live in a world that doesn't even get it. This is, I took this picture in Our Planet Fitness just over here. That is how insane this world is right now in your truth. Look at the signs next to, in the end, it's all about you. No egos. Are you kidding me? Do we not see that that is the world we live in? Standing right next to each other, not realizing that you cannot actually be the full good citizen, a loving neighbor, a real brother to another person, and live by your truth. Your truth is an independent nation. It separates people apart. There has to be something that's shared and agreed upon, and you are subject to that truth. Something that's above you and beyond you. Or else you say dumb things like that. It's not about you. Or it's all about you, but no egos. There are hidden, fallen priorities everywhere. But they are so common, we don't even really see them anymore. Let me point out two. This is where uh, the priority, the fallen, broken priorities, this is why I'm saying you have to first discover priorities. Because they're so hidden within us, we don't even see that they're there. I'm just going to point out two, and these are not like the biggest two. They're just two that I quickly thought of. One is in professional sports contracts. We love our professional athletes, and we might even call them great teammates. And they talk about how hungry they are to win a championship. No, you're not. Built into your hunger to, lead a to win a championship, underneath it, do you know what you want more? Money. Steph Curry can say all day long that he wants to win a championship. And he would be probably very hurt and offended if you said, Steph Curry, you want money more than a championship. Say, no, 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 I'm a team player. No. Steph Curry makes almost as much himself as the entire rest of the team. In fact, if you take his contract and you look at the final year, it'd be 2025 and 26 and you divide what he will make that year, if they don't even make the playoffs, just divide it by an 82-game season. Now you have what he makes in one game. Now divide that by 48 minutes in a game. You know how much he makes per minute? Over $15,000 a minute that year, whether he plays or not. 
That dude's not a team player. He doesn't even want to win a championship. He wants to make as much money as he can right now. And when we don't see that, that's when the priorities, the flipped world priorities of this world have so been hidden that we just think he's a good basketball player, really wants to win a championship, great team player, one of the greatest point guards of all time. First of all, he's greedy. First of all, he's greedy. If he wasn't greedy, he'd be winning championships because he wouldn't need to make $261 million over a period of four years. Second, uh, the second example here of places where we may not even realize what's happening. Have you ever gone into a, a luxury store and felt like the service was just a little bit stuffy and rude? Do you know that they're that way on purpose? They're that way built on research, on human behavior. Now, they won't be this way at American Eagle because it doesn't work. The service at luxury stores is intentionally rude. Why? Because there was research that was done, and if you want to go look up the research, I believe it's called Should the Devil Sell Prada? And the results of this research was that people only buy luxury goods to make up for a very specific gap in their life. You don't need a $40,000 watch unless something is missing. And they have realized that. You could go buy a $10 Timex, and functionally it does the same thing, except for what it says to people next to you. So they prey on the thing that is missing in your life, which is the need to be respected and included and admired. What they've realized is that the only people coming to shop in here are people who lack something in their life. So if we make them feel that they're not good enough to be in here, they will overcompensate and spend more money to prove that they do belong in here. That's what the research proved. Built in. It's built in. You see that? That's built into the way that our culture works is this upside down priority. And we don't even see it because it just becomes a normal part of the way we go through our lives. Jesus routinely identifies broken priorities. I read one to you. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And he just completely flips the priorities upside down. They walked in and didn't know why the service in the luxury store was rude. And he pointed at it and said, you know something's missing. The greatest in the kingdom is the least of these. He flipped the whole thing upside down. Jesus does this again and again. He specifically does it when he asks people, what do you want? Like to a blind man, what do you want me to do for you? He's making sure that he's talking not just to the obvious on the surface, but getting underneath what is important to you. What are your priorities? Self-deception is frequently the barrier between you and your next season of growth. Self-deception. It is the ability to see that when I go into the luxury store to buy that watch instead of that watch, it's because my priorities are out of whack. When I don't even see that maybe $56 million a year, $15,000 a minute disqualifies someone from being a team player, my, my priorities are out of whack. Seeing those areas of your life, that is where you have to have some level of self-awareness. But self-deception is constantly working against us. Always trying to justify, rationalize, and trick ourselves that the way we're living our lives is right and normal and balanced. And yet, Jeremiah says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Discover priorities. God the Holy Spirit is working right now to illuminate what you have been dimming. And that is the stuff that is important to you that shouldn't be so important. And maybe it's in your middle. I think I'm making a book recommendation here. It's called I Told Me So. Brian Miller and I have been talking about this book here and there. Dr. Ten Elshoff wrote this book. I read it, I don't know, maybe 12 or 13 years ago, and it just completely upended my life and began a, a move in a new direction, realizing just how it actually points out. It painfully identifies for you, this is the way you're deceiving yourself, and this is what it's doing. Let me read just one quote from it. Who better to see through my deceptive techniques 
to confront me with the hard truths about myself, to see through my defensive strategies. Who better to love me perfectly, even when I disagree, dig in my heels, and defend needlessly? A moment's thought makes it more or less obvious that community with God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit is by far the most important thing I've got going for me when it comes to finding my way out of self-deception. The Holy Spirit, through the community of the church, works to improve our priorities. You cannot find better priorities until you first open yourself to the possibility that you have self-deceived into your current priorities. And maybe they're buried deeper than you can dig. Maybe they're buried underneath. So you'll find one priority and hold it up because you don't want the other one to get touched. It's down there too deep. And I'm telling you that those deep priorities, the things that are so deeply desirable that you don't know who you are without wanting that, that's what God wants to talk to you about. Those deep, deep, deep ones. They have to be discovered. Now, there's an important little phrase in, in that famous uh, text in Romans do not conform to the pattern of the world, but be transformed, which implies that you are not the transforming person. You receive transformation. I'm giving the same thing here. You don't discover it on your own. You can do some level of digging on your own, but you are not uh, an exploring discoverer in your own life. You allow yourself to be discovered. You open yourself and reveal yourself before God and say, discover my priorities, Lord. Show me the things that are important to me because the heart is deceptive above all things. So you can't find it yourself. Discover my priorities. That's the first one. What is number two? Improve your priorities. Once your priorities have been discovered, it's time to improve them. And this is the great thrust of our biblical authors. In fact, holy saints of the church live in this constantly improving priorities. What you see in their lives is they're improving their activities. They're not. They're improving their priorities, and they act out of those priorities. So you see on the surface, oh, they do this, and they do this, and they do this, and that's what it is to be holy. No, that's what it is to have good priorities. That's why they do the things that they do. Godly people are always working to have their priorities improved. Godly people ask to be searched. Psalm 39, search me, O God, and know my heart. Job says, let God weigh me with honest scales that he may know my integrity. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul writes that we don't do this in order to please men, but God who examines our hearts. And in Acts, right at the first chapter, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us godly people with revealed hearts have the immense joy of improved priorities. Uh, when Jade and I lived in Marion, uh, we attended a church there, and we would go to a small group on Wednesday nights. And there was a man who he would often sit across the table from us. His name was Ed Hoover. And um, his, his perspective of life, his priorities, the way he viewed things was markedly different than everyone else in the room. And Jade and I were um, in a different generation than most uh, everyone else in the room. He was in their generation, and Jade and I were probably 25 years younger than anybody else in the room. And he was several years their senior at that time. And yet when we would bring up something that we were dealing with, or I would bring up an idea Jade would bring up some, something that, that I felt was like a cutting edge, like that's what we want our church to do. He was the first one to grab onto it. In fact, uh, I just talked to their pastor yesterday, and I said, can you tell me what's something that you recognize uh, about Ed Hoover and how his priorities influence the way he goes about life? And he said, Nathan, it's funny, about five or six years ago, we were looking at at kind of a shifting our ministry uh, focus and developing something that was a, a little more modernized and, and practical and applicable right to our community right now. And for that, a committee of people, I picked Ed Hoover, who was nearly 90 years old. 
a nearly 90-year-old man asked to join a committee that would help the church to be cutting edge. Why? Because his priorities were on point. Time and time again, you can look back through his life and you'll see that the priority of spreading the gospel was so potent in his life that he didn't care what the method was. And so as generations and people would come through with ideas, he was allowed to to grab onto that idea and say, yeah, let's try that. Because the priority for him was not hanging on to this thing that was near and dear to his heart from that past time. That's what worked then for spreading the gospel. He prioritized the gospel above his own history, his own love of certain things and the way that it was spread during his heyday. And so later parts of his life, he was asked to be a part of cutting edge thinking. Not because he had great ideas, because he prioritized correctly. He had allowed for these things that were deep down in him that might be priorities where he hangs on to stuff or we, he has these little subtle things that he tries to move conversations or ideas this way built on something that he wants to keep, but he won't tell anybody what he wants to keep because that's buried way down deep. He's gotten rid of that a long time ago. He's holding right up front and he'll say, I'll tell you exactly what my priorities are. I want those people to meet that Jesus. How do we do that? That's his priority in life. And so you can see, based on that priority, he's included and asked to be cutting edge. Activities, I'm a, actually, if you're writing stuff down, I'm going to read it twice. Activities are either purified or corrupted by priorities. Activities are either purified or corrupted by priorities. And that's what this entire text here, 1 Corinthians 10, that's what that means. That's what I was reading. You see, what it's saying is you're trying to live this life and do things in the right way. And what if somebody invites you to supper and you thought that the food was for this, but then you realize that they actually had dedicated this to something else that's not your God? What do you do? What he's saying is that your intentions, your priorities in life, purify your activities. That's why he keeps speaking to the conscience. Now, conversely, you've had this happen before where somebody does something really nice for you, but then you realize that they had this secret motive, and then the nice thing gets ruined. So, priorities could also corrupt actions. The way you prioritize your life either purifies or corrupts everything you do. Mm. That's heavy. Some of this teaching comes out of the Mission Life podcast. If you want to go back and listen to it, I don't remember what number it is, but it's called Margin, the episode. And I actually thought about playing a tiny section of it, but... The section of it that I was going to play was actually a recording of preachers that I found talking about margin in a way that I just fundamentally disagree with. And you've heard this before. The only reason I didn't play it is I just didn't like the idea of me preaching and then playing recordings of preachers that I thought weren't telling the truth. It just seemed a little self-righteous, so I just left it out. But I want to give you this idea. Have you ever heard someone say something along the lines of, I'm just too busy and I don't spend enough time with my family. I just don't have the margin. I need to create more margin in my life for people. Is that not bonkers? Now, in in that recording, there's like five or six preachers in a row with very convincing tone of voice talking, pleading with their congregation to readjust their lives to make margin for the people that matter. Make margin to throw the baseball with your son. Make margin to spend more time with your grandmother who's in her final stages of life. Make time to go out on a date with your wife. Create margin for it. No. We don't put that in the margin. That's what I am getting at, actually. That's why I'm off to the side. That's why there's stuff in the middle of the stage. Because that's not what we put in the margin. Now, I understand that when you put an application in for a job and you get that job and they say work eight hours a day, that's eight hours. You can't say, well, I've got to spend more time doing this because, you know, my priorities. They'll say, well, then go spend time with that. You can clock out right over there. 
I understand that there's some of that that has to happen in our life, but we know when things have come into the center and have taken priority in our life that should not be in the center, so much so that we have an entire dialogue with ourselves about, boy, I just need to create more margin. And we're talking about people in that margin. Tough question. What should be in my margin? I'm going to give you a little task of something that you could do by yourself. You can do it as a couple. I would encourage you to do it with your kids. I'm going to call it a priority bullseye. Three steps. First, get a, get a pack of post-it notes and write down all the things that are important to you. 25, pick 20, whatever. Then on a sheet of paper, make a bullseye with the center being the most essential stuff. And then just start putting that post-it note where it belongs on there. Once you can visualize it and see it, it's time to stand back and have a conversation and say, why is it that we put that at the first or second ring and we almost never do it? We need to talk about that. That is the process of putting out in front of you and being very honest with yourself and the people around you about what you prioritize in an effort to improve your priorities. You discover your priorities or you have them discovered. Then you improve them. And the third step, live them. Um, Our greatest living occurs at the intersection of quality priority and quality time. Our greatest living occurs at the intersection of quality priority and quality time. Jesus had this nailed down. His mother wanted him to do something at a wedding, and what did he say? It's not my time. He knew that the time didn't line up, even if the priorities did. But then later, when it looked bizarre for him to do something with Zacchaeus, what was his reason? His reason was his priority. I came to seek and to save. And at that time, it lined up. It lined up so perfectly that he looked weird to everybody else. But because the priority and the time lined up, Jesus did something that was transformational for Zacchaeus. What are your greatest priorities and what's the right time to act on them? When you know what's important, you need to do it. If it's not a priority, then don't sweat it. You're going to get a lot of pressure. If you try to change your priorities, you know, you're going to get a lot of pressure to do things the way that you used to do them. There's an expectation now. You're someone who's like this. It's hard to change your priorities for that reason. This is the story of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler was doing everything right in his life. The problem was his priority. And when Jesus challenged him with this, he had to turn away because of his priorities. He could not live by them. Do you see that? He was doing everything right. He said he, lived, he had followed the law perfectly. He went to Jesus. So he's talking to Jesus. But when Jesus asked him to live by his priorities, it's not that he didn't know them. He knew the law, but he couldn't let go of his money. It was his priority. So when he was challenged with it, he walked away. And what did Jesus say? It's easier for a camel to walk through the eye of a needle. That's what it is for us. When you try to change your priority, that's why I said don't do anything big out of this sermon. Pick one small, strong thing. Because when you try to change and actually live by your priorities, it'd be easier to shove a camel through the eye of a needle. It's not easy to do it. That's why 90% of people stop exercising after they make some commitment. I'm going to change, but I'm going to exercise. 90% of people don't follow through on that. The man wants to do what's right, but he can't because he doesn't have the margin for it. So my challenge is if you're going to do the priority bullseye, then just pick one thing because you're going to see everything on the bullseye together or by yourself, just what's one thing that I could do better at, that I can actually live by? What's one thing that I can live by? In fact, this is an example of how bonkers, I've given you some others, how bonkers our problem with when I set my new priorities and want to live by them. 42% of people who do not exercise but want to say that the reason that they can't, this is a study that was done last year, In fact, I'm going to give you two studies done last year, and I'm going to hold them up face to face. (laughs) One of them is people that don't exercise but think that it's important, 
they don't do it because they don't have time. That's what they said. Number one reason last year that people don't exercise is because they don't have time. Last year was also the all-time high in digital consumption. The average 18-plus-year-old American spent over 12 hours a day consuming digital something. Now, the only way we get to 12 hours is if we're consuming more than one at the same time. We have time. You understand that when, I've talked about this before, and there were moans and groans. I feel it too. Whenever you say, I don't have time, what you're saying is, that's not my priority. Every single time, because we all get the same amount of time. So whoever's doing something with that time, that doesn't mean that they had more time. It means they organized their priorities in such a way that they could do it. Sorry, <laughs> that's painful. But it's what's between you and the different tomorrow. If you want that different tomorrow, you have to bite it. You have to bite the bullet and just say, man, that's going to be hard. It's like pushing a camel through the eye of a needle. I'm only going to do one. But you have to do one. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus consistently holds us accountable to true priorities. When Christ's life is lived within you, pure priorities energize your every movement. Your lives can become full of this stuff. Maybe, maybe they're full of the need for romance, dating, marriage stuff. Maybe they're full of exercise and working out, fitness. Maybe they're full of techie stuff or work. Maybe it's full of music or cleaning. Maybe you spend a lot of time working on money. Maybe that's become a priority to you. Maybe you know what's in that backpack. Maybe you don't know what's in the backpack, but you know how heavy it is. And you've been carrying around that priority. And it's bearing you down. And it's embarrassing privately to think that this could be your life. That you came to church today and psychologically the sermon, the word of God got pushed to the margin of the stage. And the stuff of your life got crowded in the middle. We're going to have an opportunity to not make a big decision today. We're going to have an opportunity to do one strong, small thing. What is it? What is it for you? What's one strong, small thing that you think, I know, Pastor Nathan, I know that if I were to go to Jesus and I were to tell him everything that I do, I know what he would point at and ask me to give it up because it's become a backpack burden for me. And it would be hard to set it down now. Maybe that's the thing to start working on that. I'm going to ask for those who are helping with communion. I'm going to ask for the band. Go ahead and begin moving into place. That's how we're going to deal with it. We're not going to deal with it with some magic repeat after me words. You're not going to write anything down. The answer to this problem is to be filled with the life of Christ. Let Christ work in you. Let Christ work in you. Don't go find your own truth. Don't start putting together self-help stuff like, I know how I need to live my life. You know what Christ says about living your life? Die unto him. Give him everything. What's the one thing he's asking for? That's the place to address pride. That's the small, strong thing. When we take communion, here's how it's going to work. The band's going to be playing some music. We'll take our time. Ushers will, will dismiss from the back. You're going to move up middle aisles and come here, and they will give you your elements. When you get your elements, I want you to feel free to move to these outside altars here and take your time. Tell Jesus, give him everything. Allow him to discover within you what priorities need adjusted, but tell him, this is the thing I'm willing to do. Surrender one more thing. Old-fashioned camp song, I surrender all. And a lot of us saying, I surrender some. What didn't you? Bring it to the altar here and surrender that, that next thing. That next thing. 
You try to do everything, you're going to do nothing. One more thing. Surrender your heart, but what's the one thing that you can give to Jesus? The one area that you can let him discover that priority, you can improve that priority, and you're going to kneel here with the body and blood of Jesus Christ and say, I'm going to live by that priority the way that I should. When you have finished praying, go around the outside and come back up to your seats. Take your time. They're, they're watching, so we won't overcrowd the altar. Take your time. And when we're done, we're going to close with prayer.